We're going to go back and make sure we got all the loose ends picked up, all the, the, the strands and strings and whatever else is going on. So, um, so for the material so far, last week we, we discussed a little bit more about the nature of the eternal realm or the spiritual realm, the angelic realm, whatever you want to call it. And um, we dis we've discussed in the past weeks the, some of the nature of angels and all that, all that good stuff. Questions so far, confusion, helpful input. I don't know if you all studied or read any more of that other paper and were able to chase down some verses, some passages this last week or not, but right. We will definitely get into that because we've got, um, next week we're going to start going into um, angels in the New Testament. Then after that, we're going to get into that, that whole context of um, the demons and the angels and the fall and their activities on earth and, and what the activity was there. And, um, and that's all part of that. And of course, just as an immediate answer to that, um, there are, of course, different positions and opinions on that. But then when we talk about sons of God and um, the things that happened in Genesis 6, yes, angels are forbidden to marry, but the thing with the fallen angels is they don't care about the rules. And so there are rules, there's God's law that they are supposed to obey and, and follow the, the rules of God, the laws of heaven and so forth, but the demonic forces and Satan, they just thumb their nose at all of God's standards, and that's part of the reason why they fell. It's because they are they have their own agenda, or they have Satan's agenda, and they've fell in line with that. So we're definitely going to be getting into that and um, chasing that out. And the other side of that is, no, sons of God are angelic beings, and here's the context, and here's why. So we'll search that out. There's two or three different opinions, variations on that. We definitely want to get into that. To clear some of that up, because if you go out there and search out YouTube videos on a number of things, you're going to get all kinds of wild things, aren't you? You know, so let's clear some of that up. Um, that's the, we'll we'll probably get into that. I'm hoping in a, in a couple of weeks, and we'll, that'll be part of that. We'll we'll back up and we'll look at the fall, and the types of activities and why, beginning in the Old Testament, and sweep through and see what Satan's agenda is and how he's been behaving or misbehaving through that time. Um, well, what I want to do, I thought there's a couple of really cool passages that we should get into. I think we need to go in and spend a little bit more time. I kind of hit on it last week, and, and um, we're going to start in Genesis 18. So if you want to turn there, Genesis 18 and 19. And the reason why this passage in particular is we've got a couple things going on here. Um, so we know God created these angelic or living creatures ultra-dimensional beings in another realm that are different from us. We've seen that there's some physical contact. We had some angels in, in Genesis dragging Lot and his family out, so there's physical contact. We have um, Isaac preparing food for some angels who are there at the time, so there's some physicality there. Just clearly they're not the same nature as us, right? Uh, some angels have, they, they don't describe wings at all, but they look like a man. Um, some have two wings, some have four, some have six, some have a single face or it doesn't really go into description at all. Some have two faces, one on the front and one on the back. Some have four faces and it, it's just wild in different configurations. So just like the animal kingdom here in this earth, now the angels are above the animals, but I'm just saying just as we have variety there, we don't really want to have to go to the animal kingdom. We can look at people. You know, there's nobody else in here looks like me, and I'm sure you all feel like, amen. So there's variety. God creates variety, and he's all about variety in the animal kingdom, in the angelic realm, among us, among plants, um, among microorganisms. So God's all about different varieties and things. So we see all of that. But what we have landing right here is we've got a couple of angels um, here in this scene and we mentioned last week, too, is the angel of the Lord, which is um, a phenomenon we kind of touched on in the past. We've had opportunity to. Um, and he is addressed as the Lord or Yahweh. Um, and he frequently receives worship. And sometimes people will talk to 
this man who's the angel of the Lord. And they will say, I'm going to name this place this because I've seen God or whatever. So they didn't say, I've seen the angel, I've seen God. So they knew what they were seeing. So it's an interesting phenomena. So second person of the Holy Trinity that we know as Jesus Christ, before he came down as a babe in the form of a man born of Mary, there were times when he popped in here and there on the earth and is addressed that way. This is sometimes called a theophany. Sometimes it's called a Christophany. People will debate whether sometimes, well, that was a theophany, not necessarily second person of the Trinity. It was a different one. That's highly debatable. and We won't get into that minutiae here. The point is, is that all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're all God and they're all equal, right? Um, so we have this fascinating thing going on here, and, and the debate continues on whether or not this is just three angels or whether it's two angels and a Christophany. Have I lost anybody so far? You've probably kind of familiar with this? I think it answers that as you keep going through. It does, you know yeah. I mean? like if you read 18 and 19, are all one connected passage. Yeah, it is. So that's why I would just kind of blaze through here, and we'll look at some of this wording. Um, Pastor Greg is absolutely correct in that, and that it pops out. You know, I've debated with people about this before, but I think you'll see it. So, and another thing I want to caution you about that you will see as you study this sometimes you'll see a passage and it'll talk about the angel of the Lord and then it'll talk about and God and um, it'll say it might before that it might say an angel an angel and then it date maybe two or three verses later on might say the angel or the angel of the Lord sometimes it might even say the angel of God um, and so it'll shift, it'll pivot in the phrasing a little bit. So context is key, right? Anytime we read a passage, we read scripture, like real estate, location, 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 we want to look at context to get the meaning. We don't, it's usually a mistake to isolate a phrase or a verse and hang a whole doctrine on that. Um, even if a verse or phrase or something we're reading is kind of isolated in a passage, we pretty much can guarantee that elsewhere in Scripture it's addressed. Um, and ultimately, who inspired the Bible? Who is the author of the Bible? So this is God's Word. There's not going to be, there are not going to be any contradictions. There'll be apparent contradictions. But sometimes these apparent contradictions we need to work through and study and pull together so we can under, get the correct meaning, knowing that, well, if I'm seeing a contradiction or I'm seeing something wrong, it's probably me. And that happens you know, more frequently than, than maybe it should. So let's get into this. Let's look at these distinctions here. But we have this right away in, in verse 1. You see, and the Lord, or and Yahweh, appeared to him by the memory as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. Well, it says right there, three men, right? Again, context. we got to keep reading. So we have to understand, too, not only ancient thought, but Eastern thought is different than the way we would understand things. So we cannot impose our Western way of thinking sometimes on the text and state emphatically, no, no, you're wrong, or yes, this is right. We can't always do that. When you talk about Jesus crucified and he got nails through his hands, Western world, hands, right here in the palm of the hand. Well, any good doctor or anybody good in forensics at all will tell you that the, the palmy flesh right here with the way the bones are, you've probably seen pictures, the bones extend all the way down through Right, Marge? They keep going like all the way down through there. And so it's just going to tear and come down. What they used to do, and they found artifacts, they found chipped bones and things like this, is hands, ends of the arm, right here. So the ends of the arm, the whole ends of the arm in Eastern thought, when you look at old texts, are the hands. So 
we have to look at the context again. Just this is just to emphasize that that's going to matter when we're reading these things. And yes, we see three men, but is it really three human beings, as in what we are? I think verse one, he says, Lord. It does say the Lord. It says Yahweh. But then it says three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent to meet them, and bowed down or bowed himself to the earth. Now, John did this also in Revelation, right? Remember that? And, and others have done it. Isaiah did this. What were they told, you know, as far as worship? So clearly we have somewhere in this mix we have the Lord. Um, he said, O oh Lord, and that right there, notice it, you, a lot of your versions might be lowercase. It's like, sir. It says, sir, have I found favor in your sight? Um, do not pass by your servant, or if I have. I keep reading it down a little bit further. We're not going to read every single verse in here because it might take a while. Look down verse 9. They said to him, um, where's Sarah, your wife? Um, and he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, uh, the way of women had uh, ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself. So she's back yonder in a tent, listening kind of at the door, and she laughed to herself, um, saying, after I'm worn out and the Lord, my Lord is old, he says, so I have pleasure. So the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord, Yahweh? At the appointed time, I will return to you. About this time next year, Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I didn't laugh because she was afraid. He says, no, but you did laugh. Then the three men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom. Abraham went with them um, and set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that I am what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become um, a great and mighty nation. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have chosen him. Do we know anywhere in the Bible where angels choose people for anything? So that's another good indicator, right? That he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very, very grave, I will go down to see whether they have uh, done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. Um, and if not, I'll know. So Abraham starts interceding for Sodom because he's, um, you know, he knows his, he's got relations down there. So he wants, you know, lots out there. So. He bargains with the Lord, and this passage right here I want to point out is an excellent rapture passage. You say, Dave, why? What does this have to do with the rapture? You remember when Jesus in, in Luke, his version, the, the version that Luke recorded of, the, of uh, the Olivet Discourse was that the end times would be as in the days of Noah and of Lot. Where we got all this grievous sin on the world and whatever else, and uh, wrath, descriptions of wrath and God's great anger poured upon the earth. Well, so Abraham is here bargaining with the Lord, and he gets all the way down, and he, yeah, let's, let's pick it up, uh, you know, verse 29, chapter 18, verse 29, he says, again, he spoke to him. He's been, got, the number's getting whittled down, whittled down. You're probably familiar with this. He says, suppose 40 righteous people are there. He says, uh, for the sake of 40, the Lord says, I, I won't do it. I'm not going to pour my wrath out on it for the sake of 40. He says, oh, Lord, don't get mad, don't be angry, and I'll speak. Suppose there's 30 there. And the Lord says, I won't do it if there's 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 20, I won't destroy it. Then he said, oh, Lord, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again. But this once, suppose 10 are found there. And he answers, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way, and when he finished speaking to Abraham, he went and returned to his place. Um, as, as we keep going later on, what you will read is, you'll read the angels, which we kind of looked at last week in, in chapter 19, were saying, you've got to get out of here. 
I can't even do this. I can't pour my wrath out on this until you're gone. So let's go. And the angels are grabbing them by the hands and dragging them out of the town. So we as the church actually indwelt by a very God, is it likely that wrath is going to be poured out on the earth even for the sake of 10 people here on the earth that are righteous? So that's the conditions you have this time of wrath, the 70th week of Daniel, this that we have wrath beginning right away in, in um, the seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6. That's an excellent passage to look at the evil in the world and the purpose for God pouring out wrath, and that's what he does here. So we have in chapter 19, we have that the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Um, and he said, My lords, please... Turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night, wash your feet, etc., etc. Um, we have, mm, look down verse 7. I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters um, who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you uh, and, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Um, but they said, stand back. And then we have... Um, the Lord smiting them and uh, blinding them. So Lot at least recognizes that there is some form of authority over him here by these beings. He's calling them Lord, and I've, you know, I've found favor in your sight. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, continue in verse 19. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, the city is near enough for me to flee. This little one he's pointing at, the little one, he's let me escape there. Uh, he says, that, and that's just a little one, my life will be saved. And in verse 21, he said to him, behold, I grant you favor, which is similar to the way we'd say it in English, or I'm, I'm going to give you a blessing, right? God's favor on uh, Lot, uh, that I won't overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive here. Therefore, the name of the city shall be called Zoar which means little. So the sun had risen on the earth. Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and in the valley and the inhabitants of the cities and uh, what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Uh, Abraham went early in the morning to the place that he had stood before the Lord and he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land in the valley. And look, behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and Lot in the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So we'd have to continue reading. Lot is going to have some commentary here. This is, Lot is still in the picture in this discussion. We'd have to read through and find out if... Um, in Lot's conversation, if he acknowledges and says anything to indicate um, that he knows for sure those were angelic beings or that maybe they were just generals or somebody else in authority or something who came to destroy the city. It's an interesting question. And search this out. Um, and this is what it's all about is reading it through. And, and there might be. So where do, where do we took it from there without getting lost in this whole discussion any further and wondering about this at all. What are some other things that we can do to really search this out? Well, we can get out a Bible dictionary. You can get out a concordance. You can look, look up more passages about Sodom and Gomorrah. Look up more. There might be places in the New Testament that mention Lot, that discuss Lot. And so somebody might say something, might have written somewhere, somewhere else in another context in the scripture that addresses that, that will shed light on that whole discussion altogether, right? So there is, um, there are other places in the Old Testament, and they're similar in that there'll be a mix sometimes of this, or sometimes there'll be just the angel of the Lord, or sometimes there'll be angels. Now, what are some other things that happened? Um, I handed out that sheet. I think Ben handed some out to you. If you look part, halfway down, so we talked about that a little bit. Angels appear in Genesis 18, also in 19. But there are some other chapters there that, you know, we, in the interest of time, we're not going to hit each and every verse. This is what I hope you'll pick that up and search it out on your own. 
we see there under Assyria, and this is a topical index here, just so you can see subject-wise. Because you can use, um, you know, BibleGateway.com, and you can type in angel, and it'll give you uh, a biblical listing of all kinds of angels every time the word is mentioned. But this is just by subject matter. So you got Assyria, um, you got an army of Assyria destroyed by the angel of the Lord in Isaiah 37, which is interesting. So that's the Lord as a theophany stepping down and wiping out an entire army. Um, under the subject of captain, angel of the Lord is called that, uh, Joshua 5, 14, and then 2 Chronicles 13, 12. Um, Are those, I think last week you mentioned that angel of the Lord was usually, unless I misheard it, was like Christophany, like it was the pre-incarnate Jesus? Most, most often... Are those two examples? Yeah, those are two examples of that. You'll see that mostly in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, a lot of times um, you'll see the angel, the angel will this, and an angel this. But it's it's not usually called um, the angel of the Lord. You don't usually see that language so much. And again, you have to look at the context of what's going on. And And why would that be? Why would we not really see the angel of the Lord in that phrasing in the New Testament, what are some possible reasons why? Because he's there, yeah, at the time he's there, but yeah, he's there and he's coming. He's done what his intention was. And once Jesus, once God the Son, second person of the Holy Trinity, steps down and becomes Jesus Christ, we don't ever see anywhere in Scripture where he becomes anything different, right? He's glorified. He's got... Uh, He's, his um, newly created body um, that's still physical. Thomas touched he went and had fish, ate meals and things with the disciples. Different paradigm than what he was before. So there he's in glory. And we don't need a messenger. Because we, we don't need a messenger, yeah. Well, but see, here's, the, and this is interesting, is that angel does mean messenger, and it's an uh, ambassador-type position uh, stepping in um, on behalf of the Lord to deliver a message. We had Jesus do that in Revelation chapter 1, didn't we? Where he came in, he says, one like the Son of Man, and he, there he was. And so we get this context in the, in the vision that John sees that he, it's clear that he understands that this is Christ. Let's see. Sometimes called the angel of his presence. If you look partway down, you'll see, you'll see that also another passage angel of the Lord like that would be Judges 13. Um, Jacob wrestles with an angel. Yeah, because he even names the place after him, right? Um, he'll see, he'll be the angel of God in Judges 6.20. See, he was, in Judges 6.21, he's angel of the Lord, he's angel of God in verse 20. Um, also, we see verse 22. I don't think I've got that necessarily on this sheet, but you'll see that uh, if you look in, in Judges 6, you'll see that mix there. But visit Judges 13 is another, another passage you might scribble on your sheet. Do you have any more of those sheets? I believe we do somewhere. Ben, do we have more of those sheets somewhere? Oh. Poor Hillary. Um, famously... We see the angel of the Lord speaking to for uh, for Hagar, right? And that, that's an early visitation of the angel of the Lord going before Hagar. Let's see, Greg already covered briefly Ezekiel 1 and all of that, so about different types of angels and how they can look, and that looks like something from a sci-fi movie or something. Um, Genesis 32, the Christophany there. And then we have David's vision of the angel of the Lord um, beside the threshing floor of Ornan in 1 Chronicles 21, 15 to 18. More questions so far? 
because we can keep going, but I want to make sure that understand this dynamic. If you'll have angels, you'll have the angel of the Lord, sometimes accompanied by an angel or two, sometimes not. A lot of times you'll have angels coming by themselves. You have, we talk about different instances where we see angels coming to speak to Daniel, right? Uh, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel what? Daniel 8, Daniel 9, Daniel 10. We see angels coming to speak to Daniel. And What's confusing is they use the word angel. Angel. So when you read angel in English, you're thinking of an angel. Right. But the word means messenger. So, so if we get behind that and not get hooked up on that, it's an angel. Yeah. Because many times when you're saying the angel of the Lord seems to be referring to God manifest in some human form. Yeah. Pre-incarnate Christ. And there's a lot of those passages. I know we're not getting all into angel of the Lord here, but clearly there's the angel of the Lord who is God, and then there's angels. Yeah. So sometimes just the context really tells you that. Yeah. That's exactly very right. Easy to discern when it's the Lord. It's pretty clear you're talking to the Lord when it's an actual angel. So it's the angel of the Lord is the Lord's being the messenger himself, representative of the entire Trinity, the entire Godhead. And then sometimes you'll find in places like Ezekiel or in places like Revelation where you see um, the living creatures. Why aren't they called angels? Whatever power the Lord wants to give, give them that any being can have outside of the powers that he alone has, like his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence. Um, so none of the angelic beings demonstrate any of these things. They're limited knowledge. Um, they're more powerful than us but still limited compared to what God can do. So God creates them for specific purposes. We have, um, we will get in uh, next week, we'll take a look at some of, some of the angels we might look at in the New Testament. If you start looking at that and you look ahead, you'll see some angels um, flying over the earth during the tribulation week, and they're saying, whoa, 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 and there, some are proclaim, proclaiming woes, some are proclaiming the gospel, so you've got at least three angels right there, and they're, on behalf of God, they're delivering a message. Sometimes the message is, is wrath, though, too. So you have that kind of dynamic. So very interesting, right? So, it, it, yeah, and to Greg's point, you know, we're, we might be familiar with uh, Asian nations, and here, Native Americans, the way you name names will be based on what somebody's function is, what their task is, what mom saw when the baby was born, or something prosaic like that, you know, dances with wolves, right? I mean, you, they'll name things like that. Well, this is very much true. You will find if you look up um, where it's not necessarily overtly in the storyline of somebody's birth in the Old Testament, if you were to look up a lot of names, you'll see that they have very specific meaning. What we'll do in the West is we'll name somebody after another beloved relative or whatever, that kind of thing, or because it sounds nice. So we'll make something up. You know, somebody say, you know, I heard somebody say the name Shekinah the other day at church, so I think I'll name her Shekinah. No, don't do that. But, but, you know, sometimes, yeah, a lot of Jesus is or Jesus out there, right? This will guarantee he'll get into heaven and we'll name our daughter Mary. That way we'll guarantee she gets in too, Maria. So there's a bunch of names, different reasons why in Western culture we do things differently than they do in Near Eastern and Far Eastern cultures, Native American cultures. But biblically we'll see that. Now, what does, uh, what does the name Michael mean? Yeah, he's like the God or like the Lord. Yeah, he's like God. We we see the name L a lot of times plugged into names of cities or a place where they're going to build a, a monument or an individual. Danielle, Michael, this kind of thing. Uh, Ezekiel because they put God's name in there as a, sometimes as a, like a devotion to the Lord as well. So we're going to see more about angels. We'll, we'll get into angels in the New Testament. 
But what I want to point out is these are the dynamics. We could go through all these verses here, and I encourage you to do that, or at the very least, this is something that I had done. I went in the Bible gateway, and I typed up the word angel, and I just hit the word, I just hit print. And, it, and I scrolled through it just to read the different verses to see what jumped out at me. And what jumped out at me was starting right off the bat, Genesis 16, Christophany, Genesis 16, 9, 16, 10, 16, 11, they're all angel of the Lord. So if you want to, I would recommend you do something like that and just uh, search it out and just read it. And you'll be surprised at how often you see the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. I'm looking all through numbers here, the angel of the Lord. Um, and see the context and see what's being discussed. Now, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, uh, I brought you up from Egypt, brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. So the angel of the Lord there, who swore to Israel that he was going to give it to his fathers. You know, so that's, that's the context here. You see this kind of a thing all the time, this kind of wording. So be alert to that. Any other questions about that, about any of these? in this dynamic is what we'll do is we'll pick up next week and we'll look at um, start the New Testament next week so we'll find we can see if we can find a bit more um, I encourage you to do that then would be to maybe look up the word angel and then you can click on just the New Testament. It'll be highlighted, and, and boom, it'll populate all those verses in the New Testament. So take a look and see what you can bring to the table next week from the New Testament uh, that you see, it, particularly if it's a little bit different behavior than, than what you might have noticed before or you've heard taught before about angels. If something kind of jumps out at you like, well, I've never really caught that aspect of this before, bring it in and... and uh, share it with us or whether you know for sure what's going on with that passage or not and let's talk about it and see if we can search it out also um, continue to search out the whole Lot question when did Lot know and why what are the verses it's good to search all those things out I hate a mystery like that I will man I'm, I just get I, I think the Lord is awesome for revealing as much of his, himself as he has to us in the scriptures, right? There's so much to understand. And I hate to run across a passage and say, what does that mean? I can't tell you how much time I spent searching out things like, um, um, you know, this, the uh, seven sayings that God said to uh, John. And John is getting ready to write down. The Lord, Lord says, don't write that down. What? You're kidding me, right? So I think I found a solution to that one, by the way. We can talk about it sometime, but I, th I think I found that. Because it, it, something similar also happens in Daniel. So you can look that one up if you want. And it was seven sayings, too. Um, but the subject matter is very particular. So it's very cool. The Lord doesn't leave us out there all the time hanging. It, but it takes some searching, some passion for the Word, love for the Word, and uh, a desire to know God more to know God on a more intimate level. And then as you're reading, this is why as you read over the years, you'll be reading a passage that you've read a dozen times before. All of a sudden, something new will pop out and you say, oh my goodness, how come I, I never saw that before. How come, where did that come from? I never noticed that before. Well, it's because you were just, you know, two weeks ago, you were in Joshua. You had that in, your, in the context of your mind. So now you're reading over here and you go, oh, what in the world? I didn't see that before. So develop a passion and love for the Word and search it out. And we'll get in next week. Uh, New Testament starts getting really exciting. We'll get into some New Testament stuff. Although, I'm going to be honest and tell you that the Revelation stuff, we'll, we'll skip over the in, until we get done with the angels and demons and Genesis 6 and all the fall stuff. The very last thing we'll do, because it's in things, the very last thing we'll do is we will spend a week getting into how does this all, God's plan, wrap up with uh, angels and demons and Satan in the end? Where is, it, where is it all being brought to? What happens with them? What role do they take in the end in participation? And, then, you know, it's very fascinating, right? Anybody who's ever read that before, sometimes it can be confounding. But let's get into some of that, too. You can read, read ahead on that stuff, too, if you want. And then um, 
you know, be prepared to be prepared to bring some of that in and raise some questions and insights. All right. Let's close real quick in prayer. God, thank you so much for your word and for the many riches that are in your word, the mysteries in your word. And thank you, Lord, for the blessings of uh, granting us as we read it and we study it and we seek you out, Lord, wisdom and understanding. And Lord, we, we pray that you would grant us that as we, at any time we're studying your word. And we pray that that continues as well going into the sermons this morning. For it's in Christ's name that we pray and give you thanks and glory. Amen. Thanks.